tell me, did you guys have any complications at all with your pregnancy? Yes. Uh, mm. um, I've had, we've had four miscarriages. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a history and he's the first and only one that's attached and stayed. And so I was considered a high risk pregnancy mm -hmm. the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't suggest being a high risk pregnancy, but you get to see him every week. <laughs> so um, they've watched and um, in my family, we have a syndrome. It's called the, well, they call it Melnick Frazier now, um, or bronchial otorenal syndrome. And it affects your ears, your kidneys, um, and your throat. Mm -hmm. Which, so I was concerned about kidneys. Mm -hmm. Can you watch his kidneys? Mm -hmm. And so they watched his kidneys because they were a little dilated the whole pregnancy. Um, and other than that, after that initial, after that initial, it was fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you? Did they give you a percentage, or did you know that there was a real possibility that you were going to pass this syndrome on to your son, or did you know in advance? Uh, I knew before that he had a 50-50 chance. Okay, okay. Um, and they always said that they were reluctantly optimistic. Yeah, the whole pregnancy was reluctantly optimistic. They always kept us kind of dangling. Right, always, because, yeah. yeah, they don't want to yeah. set you guys up for any kind of absolutes right until they know for sure yeah so when you finally went in to your delivery did you make at all 40 weeks 37 weeks how far along were you i was 39 mm -hmm. and i was already contract i was having contractions mm -hmm. and so she was like let's go ahead and induce okay um they wanted it to be more of a controlled mm -hmm. environment so she induced me on the first of may i labored for 48 hours wow. um I didn't, I didn't have, I had all the contractions, I did everything, but I would not dilate. Wow. Um, and then on the third, it was like three o'clock, she was like, every time you have a contraction, his heart rate drops. So at that point we decided for a C-section, you know, my baby's at risk, let's go ahead and get him out. And. 30 minutes later, here he is. Okay, so you had some red flags and some warnings that there might be some concerns with his kidneys and with his hearing and with his throat. Oh, I gotcha. Um, when did you officially discover that he had a hearing loss? Um, I was suspicious because if you look at him, his one of his ears is broken. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw immediately that he had the holes in his neck, which is part of the syndrome. So I was like, all right, he's got it. So then at that point I knew, now the levels of hearing loss varies from person to person that has it. So it goes down my mom's side. Um, and every person that has it has a different hearing loss. So um, uh, we didn't know what kind or how much at that point. We just, I just knew he had it. Um, and he failed the tests there at the hospital. Mm -hmm. They gave him the first one and said that, oh, we can wait a little while because a lot of C-section babies fail because they don't get the fluids squeezed out. I was like, well, no. I mean, I have hearing loss that I was born with. Um, it's, a, it's a great chance that he has it. I know he has the syndrome. And I had to prove that I knew and understood where it came from before they were like, okay, well, let's go ahead and do the second one. And we went from there. We found out pretty quick that it was profound. And it was hard to hear, you know, want that for your child. Especially me. I knew what he was going to have to fight. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't ever want to hear that your child is profound. He is the first one in the family that has cochlear implants. 
So that's been a different sort of adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so tell me a little bit about your hearing loss, personally. I only have about 30% in both ears. Mm -hmm. A little, one ear is a little under 30%. Mm -hmm. um, was born that way, but did not get my hearing aids until I was almost seven. I lived in a small town and I was smart enough to figure out when the guy pushed this button, it was the other side. Mm -hmm. um, my mom finally convinced an audiologist to put me in a booth by myself, and that's when they discovered that I actually really couldn't hear anything. You know, my speech was awful at that time. Um, I struggled in school because I couldn't hear, um, but I could read and all of that because my mom is also a teacher. Um, but because my mom has the hearing loss, she knew what to look for, and she knew how to kind of, she asked her speech therapist at her school, what can I do if she's not doing this, this, or this, and so she would work with me. Okay, so as you learned, did you ever, were you ever taught sign language? No. Okay. Um, did that play into your decision to get him implanted? Yes. Because I know everybody has their own preferred mode of communication. Yes. Um... I actually one year got frustrated at school um, because I was tired of repeating myself because people couldn't understand me and I also when I don't have my hearing aids and even now when I don't have a man or my ears aren't working I speak very softly mm -hmm. and so um, I got tired of being uh, having to repeat myself so I quit talking for a year I refused to talk to anybody my parents friends school I wouldn't say a word mm -hmm. And so I didn't want him to, to experience that. Um, and they were pretty quick to tell us with the hearing aids, he got no speech. Like he was way under the little speech banana. And so at that point it was like, okay, well, how can we get it so he either can get speech or do we need to start doing sign language? Mm. Initially they weren't very optimistic that the cochlear implant would work because when we did the MRI, he had one nerve that was minimal, and then the other nerve, he was like, we're not really sure it's there. So they did the minimal ear. Um, in the sound booth, he is now considered mild mm. with his implant. Mm -hmm. from hearing no speech at all to hearing it. Having a little bit of struggle. What was your first reaction the first time you called his name and he looked at both of you or he turned to you? It was kind of, are we sure, did we do them right? Like, is he, mm -hmm. is he, is he responding mm -hmm. to our voice mm -hmm. or is he, are mm -hmm. we being too hopeful? Mm -hmm. Like, we were scared too. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. It's like, wow. And then, of course, because he is so stubborn, he, you know. <laughs> it's taken a while because, you know, you have that misconception of well, the, the you know we're just, gonna go and we're, they're gonna turn on the the cochlear, mm -hmm. and um, he's just gonna he's gonna start talking and he's gonna hear and all this stuff, you know and you know the you know they they explain to you how speech works and how speech develops and all of this stuff and it's like well you never think about it because you just never think about it because you learn how to hear and you learn how to speak, you know and. Um, but you know she's right he's very stubborn and you know when when he does make that eye contact with you and you know that he hears you and he knows that he knows you're speaking to him directly mm -hmm. and it's it's amazing I it is amazing I yeah, and it's been you know i guess in that in that moment when they turned it on you see so many videos where it's like oh baby here's mommy's voice mm -hmm. and you know it's a happy we did not get that at all. We didn't yeah. get that at all. <coughs> we got at the, the screaming running under the yeah. bed, under the table. Thing. Like, oh, I'm so confused. Yeah, like, what is this? And all so of it was kind sudden, of like, yeah. well, what did we do to him? You know, like, did we really make the right choice? We just made him scream and run under the table. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so that, that in itself was kind of traumatic, you know. And of course, there's a bunch of people in the room and they're videotaping and, and it was just, you have to still maintain that optimism, but in your heart, you're like, did I really just do this? 
to make the right choice for my son. Mm. You know? Mm. Um, because he definitely didn't follow those feel good videos at all. So. Yeah. But um, now, do you think? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, today, with Gwen teaching sign language, why are you wanting to do both? Just um, our Well, our main desire is for him to use speech. Mm -hmm. But in case mm -hmm. he needs that that mm -hmm. platform, you know that. Um, yes, we want him to speak, and we want him to be part of the, the hearing world in that aspect. But in case that's he needs more, mm -hmm. we want to be prepared. Okay, so we talked about your um, ECI <coughs> services. How did you learn about ECI? Actually, um, so we were home. We had come home, and this lady starts calling from. Um, what did I Oops. have him? No, no, no. Uh, Baylor. Baylor. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, yeah, you know, he failed this test. You have to follow up with this person and this person. And I was feeling very overwhelmed because I have a brand new baby at home and I've got all these people calling me. You know, I had to make an ENT appointment for mm -hmm. his throat. Mm -hmm. I had to make appointments with the audiologist. I had to, and I had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And so this lady, you know, I, I voiced that concern at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so they had this lady follow up. I don't even know what her name is now. Somewhere I have notes. Um, and <coughs> she's the one that was like, you know about ECI, right? I was like, no. She goes, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and call them, and they'll call you and make an appointment. And he was three weeks old, and they came out and saw him for the first time. And so, it was because they had such a wonderful program at Baylor. Mm -hmm. Up with ECI. Nice. And so since he was three weeks old, how long has he been getting audiology services with? With Gwen? Mm -hmm. What was it, six months? Um, no, that was McKenzie. I came in even a little later, didn't I? We started I with three nine. weeks oh. with McKenzie. Yeah, I think I came at nine months. Nine months. I think we waited until nine months. But how would you sum up or summarize your ECI experiences so far? Um, well, ECI has been great as far as, like, we've had some other issues, like eating and, of course, walking mm -hmm. that ECI has helped us with. Um, we've since learned that walking might have been delayed because his ears are deformed. Mm -hmm. He does have a lot of liquid, mm -hmm. and so balance issues, yep. that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, because he does other things right on target. Um, and then in conjunction with Gwen, you know, we get a lot of ideas on how to build, you know, speech and how to push him to respond to us. You know, hey, I'm talking to you. Turn, turn to sound. You know, stuff that I didn't know. I mean, I was six when this when this adventure started for me, and so doing it with a baby is a, is a way different. Yeah. And so, you know, we get toys that we learn that hey, you know, this would be an easy way to do, you know, the lean sound, because there's six sounds that you want to practice with. And... Is there anything else you would like a new parent? I also had in mind of presenting this journey to new parents who have never dealt with any of this and don't really know how to deal with the diagnosis and they're just as scared. As One thing that the audiologist that did the test for him, I mean, I of course started crying right away as soon as I heard, and he told me, he was like, this is the same Elias that you had when you walked in this door. So your baby is still the same and you're still gonna love them. Um, and the more people that you have in the adventure, the easier it is. So, you know, we've got mom, dad, we've got grandma, Aunt Grammy, his other grandmother, you know, everybody's very involved. He has, 
um, Papa, his uncle. I mean, we've got a lot of family that is very invested and very much love him. And so that doesn't change. Mm. At yeah. All. 